Hey, good morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. Let's stand and worship together. Join me in prayer, won't you? Father, thank you this morning that as we gather before you, we gather before the one who is perfectly holy in every way. And we come here today to worship you. We come here to sing to you, to give thanks to you, to give praise to you, and to seek you in whatever you would want our experience with you to be today. Grant that, we pray to us, as we meet and worship you together here today, that you'll receive the glory and that we'll experience life change in whatever ways you deem necessary. I pray that you'll help us to have responsive hearts to what you would show us through all that we do, all we plan to do here today. And we pray that you'll be the recipient of the glory of it all, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As long as you're standing, turn and greet somebody. Tell them you're glad they're here today. Okay, you may be seated. Well, we are so glad that you've come our way today. If you're visiting for the first time or first time in a while, uh, there are some cards in the back of the chair in front of you, and if you don't mind, fill out one of those and leave it with us this morning as you uh, leave here today. Put it in the offering basket on the back table if you would. 
These are also our prayer cards, so if you have particular prayer requests that you'd like for us to be praying with you about, write those out on the back, same story, put it in the basket, and we'll join with you in praying about whatever those needs may be. Uh, got all kinds of things here, just one announcement. One thing here that was just handed to me, and he's sitting right here, okay. Um, Dylan Tedder has been appointed as the Smoke Monkey Goodwill Ambassador of Texas, okay? <laughs> And, and, okay, and this is not the end. This may go on and on and on until he's president of the United States. So <laughs> anyway, we are pleased. We're pleased. Um, something else I want to announce as well. If you look in your bulletin, you'll see that there's these little handouts for the sermon outline each week. And um, every once in a while, we have a children's class that uh, folds those and puts them in the bulletin. And they did that this morning. And so... All of you kids that were in that class learning about Mephibosheth and Zeba and all those, where are you? Stand up, stand up, all of you, stand up, raise your hand so everybody can see you. <laughs> Hands on service here in, a, in an important way. Uh, another thing I wanted to announce and uh, just call your attention to one more time there's still room to sign up to be involved in the re engage ministry that will be starting in September. Couples for uh, uh, strengthening and building up your marriage. And on that back table, you can see there's a place to sign up. And there's also information sheets that tell all about it and uh, what we're going to be doing. But we still have room, but may not have tomorrow. So you need to think quickly, pray about this. And if you've already decided to do that, be sure and sign that list on the back. One other thing that's really exciting for us is that uh, we recently decided to expand our global ministry here at Grace Bible Church, and we've done so by partnering with uh, a ministry called We Are In Bloom, and most of you know a little bit about We Are In Bloom, but we have one of the founders of We Are In Bloom with us today, and she's going to go ahead and just, even though you know a lot about it already, summarize what that ministry is about. So Andrea Hethley. not only teach them, but to really focus on building a rapport and teaching them about Jesus along the way, um, showing them an example of how uh, Christians live. And um, uh, it takes about seven years to convert um, a Thai Buddhist to Christianity. So that time spent is uh, really an investment in that. Um, we have some exciting news, though. We're kind of moving um, towards opening our doors to other ministries over there and becoming a little bit more of a training center to help further the work of other ministries that work with the same types of people. Um, these women uh, can range from disabled, uh, those struggling with mental health, young mothers who may have had unwanted pregnancies or who may be pregnant with an unwanted pregnancy, uh, women who feel that they must sell their bodies to support their families, girls who've been in juvenile detention, orphans, um, women who've been in prison, and a lot more. Um, these are women that don't get a chance over there. So we're really excited to start kind of moving in that direction in order to help more people and also to use the ladies that we have poured our time in over the years to help us with that new goal. Um, I do ask for prayer from everybody for our ministry. Uh, Thailand is really going through a big change in government and it's not for the better. So um, there are elections going on this week 
Um, so just pray that the Lord will prevail through all of that. Um, and also, there is a new threat on Christianity from the Chinese as more Chinese move into Thailand to flee their uh, nation. That's also bringing in a lot of Chinese officials who are then pulling out um, Chinese Christians, which also affects a lot of mission work that's going on there. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate everyone's support here who has helped us along the way throughout the past uh, several years, but I also really appreciate the church coming together and um, supporting what we're doing there. So, thank you. Amen. Thanks, Andrea. And let's pray for them right now, shall we? Let me remind you as we pray that uh, we've committed a certain financial level, $400 a month. If at any time you and you're praying for them feel or sense as you read reports and as you hear things that you'd like to support them also in a greater amount with a special offering, that's always an option that uh, you can exercise. And so uh, keep that in mind as you pray. And as you've heard explained already, things are happening over there and a lot of them are not good outwardly, but our God is greater. And so let's pray for that right now, shall we? Father, thank you today for We Are In Bloom. Thank you for Andrea and Nung and for the way you guided them to uh, begin the, uh, the ministry that now exists there and for the impact it has had and for the plans you have for the future there. And we pray, Father, for that ministry to flourish and for the good news of Jesus to go through this ministry and training women a way that they can provide for their families and, uh, and themselves and for the good news of Jesus to go through all of this so that they can come to know you in a personal way. Uh, we pray for protection for those who are working on the front lines over there constantly and we just pray you'll uh, provide Lord just the open doors that are necessary for uh, your will to be done through them. And Father we hear the statistics all the time about um, things about how difficult it is for the gospel to spread in areas like that and they're very um, uh, heart-wrenching when we hear about it but we pray that you do something supernatural something great that would uh, bring people to Christ uh, in spite of those numbers and that it would be something that would move in a way that um, would uh, defy those numbers so uh, today we just thank you that we can partner with uh, We Are In Bloom and with Andrea and Nung and um, we pray now that you'll just continue to bless in all of this. We'll praise you and we'll thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join again in singing.
sorrows deep I call when my hope is shaken torn and ruined from the fall hear my desperation for so long I've been in vain now come to my rescue so
Kids can be dismissed for Kids Church. I had a funny experience. Um, a week ago, um, one on Saturday and then one on Sunday morning, had a couple of people that I hadn't uh, had any contact with, good friends and the good friends in the Lord, brother, brothers in the Lord, who contacted me. And uh, one in particular on Sunday morning had contacted me by text, and he said, "I just want you to know that God had put your name on my heart to pray for you today," which is um, kind of a scary thing when you're getting ready to go to church. You wonder uh, what's about to happen. To, uh, uh, but everything went okay here, so uh, wh whatever the reason, uh, I always appreciated hearing from someone like that who, uh, who would pray for me. But as you come to church on Sunday morning, before we look at God's Word this morning, um, maybe you come with um, something today and you come and you say, I just wish we'd take a moment while God is near, while we're here as a group. He's always near, but when we're here singing praises to him. He's especially near. I just wonder if there's some here to, this morning who would say, I really wish we'd take a minute to pray. And so I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes for a moment, nobody looking around, but are you one of those people today? You'd raise your hand and you'd say, I really wish that we would pray today. Okay, I see several, several. Father, you see these hands, and you are near, nearer than we can possibly realize. How dare we come to worship and draw so close to you and offer the best we know how, our praise, our thanks, but fail to realize that you want us to leave our troubles with you. And so today, there are those who, for one reason or another, have raised their hands because they're feeling some duress or somebody they know is suffering, and hearts are heavy about those things today. And so we would just ask today, collectively, and as you hear them praying right now, that you would draw near, touch their hearts about that situation, remind them of your control, Remind them, O oh Lord, that you're working out your plan. But I would just pray there would be a sense of peace and joy 
an encouragement that would come to each of these. Or an answer, maybe, that's just being sought. But Father, put your hand on us today. Those of us who've raised our hands and those of us who haven't, even though we too have issues. Thank you for listening, Lord. Thank you for working. Thank you for giving us the privilege of prayer through our Savior, Jesus Christ, and through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Now open our eyes to the scriptures that you want us to look at today as we look into the life of Jesus a little more fully. And help us to glean from this today all that we should. And for this, we will praise you and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God is listening. God is listening. Well, there's something of a, say, of a saying that has almost become an American proverb. Everybody's heard it at one time or another. And teachers and theologians and, and philosophers and so forth have kicked it around a lot. Um, nobody ever seems to really come up with the answer if there is an answer to it. But the issue is, um, have you ever heard that uh, opportunity only knocks once, but temptation tries to kick the door down? Ever experienced that in your life? You know, there are times when uh, we have an opportunity to do something and, and, and we feel like we've got to do it right now because otherwise it'll pass and we'll never get another opportunity like that. But the second half of that statement we're kind of insensitive to sometimes because temptations surround us, temptations fill us, temptations bombard us, and we often don't even realize what they are in our own lives and how many times we cave into those things that are temptations to us. Well, resisting temptation is one of the most difficult and relentless challenges of the Christian life. Um, it raises its head uh, day after day, whether we're aware of it or not. It comes in many varieties and many forms. Uh, for some of us, it may be in the form of, of seeking after pleasure. You know, we always just want what makes us feel good, and we want to do the thing that is the path of least resistance and the thing that gives us everything that we want. It may be in the form of a pursuit of possessions, materialism. We live in a country where, you know, we have far more than people in just about any other place in the world. I know a guy who gets up in the morning, he's a Christian, and he gets up every day, and the first thing he does before devotions and anything else is he goes and he checks his uh, portfolio, his investment portfolio. He's in pursuit of that. Uh, for somebody else, it might be power. Uh, you know, we want to have control over things and maybe control over other people. For some of us, it might even be pride. We think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. And um, we want others to think highly of us, too. And so we're very concerned about our image and about our pride. Well, in our study of uh, the life of Jesus today, we come to something that can really help us in the war that we ought to be waging with temptation because he underwent the greatest warfare and temptation that is found anywhere in the pages of God's Word in what is often called the wilderness temptation, the wilderness temptation, where Jesus went one-on-one -on -one with the most powerful evil force in the universe, Satan himself. And today we're going to take a look at that, that battle, and we're going to look at the Matthew version of it. It's in Matthew chapter 4 and the first 11 verses. If you want to read more fully, you can read in Mark chapter 1, and it's reported there in just a couple of verses, and then in Luke chapter 4, it's also recorded in about 13 verses at the beginning of Luke chapter 4. But as you look at that, we're going to see that uh, Jesus, at the very beginning of his ministry, is impelled to go into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, and there he goes one-on-one -on -one with Satan. And we're going to see not only how Jesus overcame that temptation and hopefully answer some questions about why that was necessary, one of the things I want to keep pointing out is that a lot of the things we're studying about the life of Jesus are going to be things that maybe we can't fully understand, but it was necessary as the part of his father's plan for him that led him ultimately to the cross to die for our sins. Well, we'll try to deal with that some today, but also I want us to see something else as we look at what Jesus did. Um, there are some things here, some principles that then can help us. And the way that he overcame temptation, there are some things that we can learn about how we can fight successfully the war against temptation. So Matthew chapter 4, where we will start today, and we'll look first of all at Jesus' warfare in the wilderness, 
And in the first couple of verses of Matthew chapter 4, let's kind of paint some boundaries around the story as it's given to us here. Let me read the two verses and then we'll pick these out. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. Now let's notice some things about how this all occurred. You may have been here last week, and if you were, then you may remember what we covered last week about Jesus' baptism. This happens immediately after Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. In fact, Mark adds an interesting word in there that the other two Gospels that I mentioned don't, and it is that word immediately, immediately. Right after the baptism, the next step of Jesus' obedience to his heavenly Father was to go alone into the wilderness, into the wilderness. And so it was part of the Father's plan. Now, when we look at that word wilderness, that's another thing that we ought to pay attention to. When I think about a wilderness... Uh, from where I grew up, the wilderness was trees and forests and hills and hollows, and, you know, you could get lost in there if you weren't really careful. There had been a time or two when I was hunting and, and kind of lost my bearings about where I was. I was in new territory. I was in the wilderness, in the wilderness. Well, this is not the kind of wilderness that I grew up in, up in Indiana. In fact, we saw pictures earlier uh, in one of the songs we were singing or some of the songs we were singing that looked more like the wilderness that would be the wilderness of that day and time. No trees, maybe a few scraggly bushes here and there, but just totally barren landscape, desert with uh, mountains and hills, and, but it would be out there in the middle of nowhere where no person in their right mind would ever go. The wilderness, the wilderness. Mark 1.13 adds an interesting detail here when it says that he was with the wild beasts, it says out there with the wild beasts. And this is talking about the carnivorous beasts, the dangerous beasts, you know, lions and wolves and things like that. It's in a place where nobody in their right mind would ever go. But that's where Jesus went. And notice also what I just read moments ago, that he had fasted for 40 days, 40 days. Um, He fasted, by the way, not to lose weight, not to purge his system, and all these reasons given today as to why people should regularly fast, but he fasted for the reasons that are primarily presented in the scriptures, which was to totally devote himself to the pursuit of what his heavenly father had for him and the plan that he had for his life. Fasting in the Bible is frequently presented that way where we separate ourselves totally from everything else, every bit of food, every other person, every other activity in order that we may just totally focus our attention upon our relationship with God and what we're asking him to show us that he wants for our lives. Jesus had fasted 40 days, 40 days out there, seeking the next direction for his life from his heavenly father. Notice also how it happened anyway. How did he know to go out there? Well, if you look at the verse again, it says he was led by the Spirit. This is the same Holy Spirit that came upon him at his baptism remember, as Jesus came up out of the water, the scripture says this supernatural thing took place where the clouds parted and there was this thing that came down, this ethereal thing that came down and lighted upon Jesus like a dove, the scripture says, and just kind of disappeared right into him. It was the Holy Spirit. And then there was that powerful voice of the Father, my beloved, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It's that Holy Spirit that led him. And once again, if you go to Mark's gospel in chapter 1, you discover that it doesn't say he led him, but Mark, in his own unique way, uses a more powerful verb, which means it impelled him, commanded him, not just simply that he led him, but Jesus felt he had this as the direct path that he needed to take at that particular time he went. Notice who else is here as we... um, Look down into verse 3. The scripture says the tempter came. There's somebody else there. The only other one who is there. And in this passage of scripture, we're going to see him named in three different ways. He's Satan. He's the devil. He's the tempter. The greatest enemy of mankind. The greatest enemy of God. The one who, according to Isaiah 14, wanted to be like God. And he's called by all three of these names here. 
as he comes to confront Jesus. And we kind of get an idea about what this is all about when we look at one more thing. When it says that Jesus was led in verse 1 into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. To be tempted by the devil. That's a detail that sometimes gets overlooked when we study this passage of Scripture. That um, who was on the offensive here? Sometimes it's viewed as if Jesus kind of just went out there to pray and whatever. And uh, oh, Satan showed up. And it was just kind of a by accident sort of thing. And so Jesus is on the defensive, you know, ducking and weaving and so forth to avoid what Satan's going to hurl at him. But the fact of the matter is, is God is on the offensive here. God has put his son into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit has impelled him to go so that Satan could hit him with every piece of heavy artillery at his disposal in an effort to dissuade him or redirect his path away from why he had left the glory of heaven to begin with. But the reason for this whole thing, I think, is found right there and that God was in control of the situation. And it is as if God said, here's my son, hit him with all you've got, and I want you to see that you'll never succeed against him. He will not fail in what he came to do. He could not fail in what he came to do. And that's what we find in this passage of Scripture, Satan hitting him with all the heavy artillery, but he's unable to do anything to dissuade Jesus from why he came. Well, most of you have probably had this passage taught to you before, you've read it before, and you know that there are three specific temptations or attacks that were leveled upon Jesus that are uh, talked about here. But there was something else that needs to be recognized, I think, is that while we think in terms of just these three attacks that were leveled against Jesus, if we look at the verb tenses in the Greek text, what we discover is, is that these were not the only three attacks against Jesus in this 40-day period. He was attacked throughout the whole 40 days. We don't know what the other attacks were. We don't know where Satan started, and we don't know if he intensified the attacks as time went on, but what we do know is that it reached a pinnacle. It reached its peak with these three at the very end of this 40-day period. And so we look at these three specific things that he hit him with here in uh, Matthew chapter 4. Here's the first attack, the first attack in verses 3 and 4. And uh, this is attack, an attack that concerned God's provision for Jesus, God's provision for Jesus. Remember, he has uh, been fasting for 40 days. And uh, the temptation, well, let's read about it right here. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. And then Jesus will give his answer. Something we need to recognize here at the outset as we think about uh, this first statement, by the way, uh, if you are the Son of God. Uh, again, the Greek text is really important for us here to understand because it's not as if Satan didn't know who he was dealing with in this particular instance. In the Greek text, this is something that's referred to by grammarians as a first-class conditional sentence. And the translation is fine. It could be translated if, so forth. But actually, the idea of it in a first-class conditional sentence is that the condition is assumed to be true. If you are the Son of God means since you are the Son of God, because you are the Son of God, because you have all this power to do what I'm instructing you now to do. You're hungry, and it would be just a small thing for you to just simply with a wave of the hand or just by casting a thought to turn a rock into a loaf of bread. And from human perspectives, to save your very life. If you are the Son of God, then turn these stones into bread. And at first glance, you know, we could probably say, what would be the harm in that? Why would that be such a big deal? Jesus hasn't eaten in 40 days. He's obviously very weakened. He's always obviously vulnerable to attack. And, and he's... And he's at that stage, you'd think, well, he can't be thinking real clearly, and, and nobody else is around. You know, what would be the big deal if he just did this? If he just took it upon himself to take care of his, of his, intense, uh, of his intense hunger? Well, first of all, it should be obvious to any of us. Who would Jesus be listening to if he did that? Who would he be paying attention to? Who would he be obeying 
If he listened to that voice and that piece of encouragement, that piece of instruction, who would he be listening to? Does the Bible ever tell us to listen to Satan? Should we ever listen to Satan? (laughs) No, we should never listen to Satan, should we? That's precisely what Jesus would have been doing. But in the bigger sense, what Satan is doing, as he does throughout this series of attacks that he levels against Jesus, he's seeking to get Jesus to do things independently of what God the Father would tell him to do, what God the Father would show him to do. It's one of the greatest things that we and I wrestle with when it comes to the things of temptation, to do things that we feel like we ought to do because we can do them and because we have the resources to do them and because it seems right and so forth, but we never have talked to God about it. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. Just because we have the resources doesn't mean that's the right thing that we ought to be doing. That's the temptation that is being cast at him right here. And notice how Jesus then responds to him. And he responds to him by referring to a passage of Scripture. Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That comes from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. How many of you um, do your daily devotions out of the book of Deuteronomy? Anybody do that? No, probably not, right? Probably not. Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. And uh, do you catch what he's saying here? He's saying here, you know, uh, we take physical food in for our physical needs, but don't forget the second half. We need spiritual food for our spiritual needs. Physical food will not meet our spiritual needs. We may be healthy as we can be, but so what? If we're not feasting on the Word of God, if we're not taking this in, if we're not living by this, then uh, we're really missing out on something that is just as vitally important as sitting down and having a meal each day with our family. Well, the second temptation, verses 6 and 7, or verses 5 and uh, 5 through 7. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now we're in Jerusalem. I will not bother to debate today what scholars like to debate when they get into these kind of stories. Is, you know, did... Uh, the devil actually take Jesus physically and actually place him on the temple? Or, or was this just a, a vision that he gave to him? If you were standing on the temple and all those sorts of things, we'll leave that for another day. But uh, the issue that is being raised here, uh, Satan almost, because Jesus quoted Scripture, said, oh, you want to play games with Scripture? Well, I can quote Scripture too. And he quotes a passage of Scripture here, Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. And if you go back to the Old Testament, you'll see that passage of Scripture quoted in part here by Satan. And again, there's a lot of issue made about, well, he didn't quote it perfectly. He didn't quote all of what was said in that psalm and, and so forth. Satan has been accused of, uh, you know, of misquoting and so forth. One thing we ought to recognize is Satan knows Scripture too. You realize that? Satan knows Scripture And he can cause us to misinterpret Scripture. He can cause us to do wrong things because we have not rightly understood a particular verse, a particular passage. Uh, He quotes Scripture back to Jesus and says simply to Jesus, uh, and this concerns now the protection of God on Jesus' life. Well, if you really believe in your Father, I mean, look at you. Forty days of fasting, my, you're just... Skin and bones. You're weak. Your father hasn't been taking very good care of you. Uh, Takes him to the temple, the pinnacle of the temple, and says, throw yourself down and make sure that your father's taking care of you. Make sure that you're in the center of his will. Once again, the temptation is to listen to Satan instead of listening to God, and this time to presume upon God's protection. If God loves you, well, he'll just take good care of you. But he's obviously not thinking much about you because look how you are. But once again, notice verse 7, what Jesus says. And he quotes from Scripture again and again from the book of Deuteronomy. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, 
It is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. We're not to test God. We're not to tell God, if you love me, this is how you have to treat me. If you love me, you'll make my bank account fat. If you love me, you'll make me healthy. If you love me, you won't let these things happen in my life, these bad things that often come into people's lives. If you love me, God, Jesus says, we don't put God to the test. We let God determine what is best for us, what's needed in our lives. And we then rely on him. If he puts it into our life or allows it into our life, he will get us through that. He'll take care of us in the midst of whatever that situation might be. But he didn't need to test God's love for him. Jesus knew the love of the Father for him. There's a third temptation. Third temptation. Now we're down into verses 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9. And um, this is the one that concerns... um, concerns the ultimate plan of God for Jesus' life, the ultimate plan for his life. And uh, Satan, I don't believe, knows everything that needs to be known about how Jesus was going to come and redeem mankind. He knew he had come on that mission. He knew God's love for people. He knew a lot of things. Did he know all the steps along the way and how that was going to play itself out and it was going to involve a cross and all those sorts of things? don't know that he knows all of that stuff. But he knows that the way that Jesus has come, and he knows from what the Old Testament scriptures have said, because he knows scripture, that it was going to be the way of suffering and sorrow and pain. He knew that it was going to be a horrid road that Jesus was going to have to travel. And so the scripture says, the devil takes him to this high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he says to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Which is to raise the question, um, why go through all of that? Since I can give you what you're looking for and it'll be a much easier path for you to travel. Why go through suffering? Why go through hardship? Why not just worship me and, and, and I can give you all of this? Now, once again, when we look at a passage like this, there are those who would question, uh, can Satan do things like that? Can he give us riches and wealth? Can he bless our lives or be the source of blessing in our lives and so forth? Well, again, we won't go deeply into this, but you know the scriptures have some particular things to say about the power and the influence that Satan has in this world. Uh, for example, he is, uh, he's called the God of this world in uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Uh, 1 John 5.19 says that the world lies in the power of the evil one. Uh, Furthermore, Jesus also said he's a liar, though, too, in the midst of all of that. He does have power. He does have influence. He is at work in the stock market. He is at work in world governments. He's at work in our government, our school, our, uh, our community, our world. He has great influence and great power. What he offers to Jesus here, though, is an easy way out, a way that doesn't involve the cross, a way that doesn't involve the plan that God has for his life. And it's at this point that I would just simply say that, again, we recognize that if Jesus had listened, who would he be listening to? Whose plan would he be following? I mean, case closed, right? Do we have to really go any further with explaining what's going on here other than to realize that Jesus would not be listening to the one voice that he needs to be listening to and why he has come and what he's seeking to work out in his life. If there was any explosion of emotion in this passage of Scripture, and I believe Jesus was an emotional man, don't you? There are times you look in the life of Jesus and you see the emotions come bubbling out even though it doesn't always say that Jesus was this or Jesus was that. Remember that time when the disciples tried to keep the little children from coming to Jesus because they felt he had more important things to do, more and more important tasks to tend to, and they tried to stop the moms and the dads and the brothers and the sisters and the grandparents from bringing the little children to Jesus. And the scripture says that Jesus was angry at them angry at the disciples and told them, let the little children come to me. 
Remember those two occasions where he went into the temple and he sees all the tables set up there and they're selling sacrificial animals and the money changers are there changing money into a form that, uh, of a currency that could be used in the worship of God? And Jesus goes ballistic, turns the tables over, drives the sacrificial animals out of there. People are scattering everywhere. Even the temple police didn't dare take him on. Remember the time that he stood outside the city of Jerusalem and wept because Jerusalem had not repented and turned back to him and he wept over them. Or at the grave of Lazarus as he wept over Lazarus' grave after his friend Lazarus had died. Jesus was an emotional man. He was an emotional man in perfect righteousness in his emotions, but he was an emotional man. And it doesn't say here that he was emotional, but I have a suspicion that those first two things he said in verse 10 had a great deal of emotion attached to them. Go, Satan. Go. Leave. You are now to give up on your task. And I think he said it loudly, and I think he said it strongly. I think he said it in a way, well, of course, God is God, and Satan cannot stand before him in a way that now Satan was dismissed from the attacks he has been leveling against him. And then for the third time, Jesus quotes scripture when it says, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Um, What book of the Bible do you think that came from? Now, Deuteronomy again, okay? Deuteronomy again. And uh, worship, uh, worship God and worship him only. And then the devil left him, the scripture says. There's no hesitancy saying, hey, wait a minute, I'm not finished. When God, when God speaks, case closed. Everything's dismissed. And the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him, the scripture says. Well, all I wanted to point out in all of this really is why did this happen? Why was this necessary? And uh, maybe I'm being overly simplistic when I say this, but the primary reason this is here was so that God could show that his son would not fail. His son could not fail. He came to achieve our salvation through his death on the cross, and he would not be distracted from that. Nothing would take him away from that. Satan's heaviest artillery could not stop him in that. He came to die for us, and he would not be stopped. And right at the beginning of his ministry... God gives that demonstration for your sake and for mine that we put our faith and our trust solely and exclusively in him if we want the gift of eternal life because this is the way that's been provided for us. Let me shift directions now if I can. And that is to you and me. Can we learn anything from Jesus tackling of this temptation situation that we find him here in Matthew chapter 4 enduring and um, anything that can help us? Well, of course, anytime we look at the life of Jesus and we see how he lived and the example that he left, we're going to find the way life ought to be lived. We're going to find the way we ought to think and the way we ought to speak and the way we ought to treat other people. And so I just threw together three thoughts here that we need to uh, keep in mind that I think we see in what Jesus has done in this instance and what he leaves an example for us to follow. The first one is simply this, is that uh, we're all going to be tempted in many ways. We can expect that. We can expect that. We're going to be tempted in many ways. Uh, Many of us maybe don't realize how many are the ways that temptation works its way into our lives. Sometimes it's just from within us, within our hearts and minds, because of the old flesh nature that is still alive and well within us. Thank you. Because we're saved doesn't mean that suddenly all source of temptation within us is removed. It can be within us. It can be on the outside of us through people that we know who are always advising us or just being friends with us and they're expressing their opinions but they're not biblical opinions and, well, their way of telling us how we ought to handle things may be the source. It could be through the entertainment industry. Ah, we see that all the time, don't we? If you watch movies, listen to music of our day and time, listen, listen to the lyrics. One thing that I've found interesting lately, it's just been on a little bit of a, just kind of a 
crusade of my own, I guess, is uh, there's a lot of these songs that we used to listen to when I was a teenager and so forth, and you listen to a lot of you when you were teenagers, and, and um, I've asked a number of people who really liked listening to that, and I like to listen to it a lot too. Do you know what those songs are about? And I keep getting these blank looks. Well, I'm not sure. And so I've been going back and online saying, what was this writer thinking about when he wrote that song? Amazing. <laughs> and it's amazing the stuff that's being written about. And uh, we're singing it, we're enjoying it, and it's not wholesome. Now, not every song's that way, but there's a lot of them that are just like that. And you say, boy, this is crazy stuff. What were we listening to that stuff for? Entertainment. You know, it could be, uh, also it could be the place we work. It could be the place we go to school. It could be the place, well, that we have anything to do with people. It could be any of those places and, and, and more. But there are many places where temptation can come at us as we see how people respond and how the world tells us how to respond to this situation or that situation. It could be anywhere. We need to expect it, so we need to be on our guards about it. A, a second thing I think I would add to that is that um, we need to call temptation what it is. So we need to uh, detect it. You know, if we have uh, come to expect it, as we look into our own lives, we maybe need to look a little more carefully at where it has made inroads into our thinking, our speech, our ways of relating to people, our ways of not relating to people, of all the different things that make up our lives. We need to look and see if we are actually following what God would say we ought to do in each of those types of relationships or those types of situations. You know, Jesus knew he was under attack and it was no problem to him instantly to know what was happening. Turn these stones into bread. You know, <laughs> come on up onto the pinnacle of the temple. Look at, from this mountain view, look at all the nations of the world. You want to rule over the nations of the world someday? And Jesus in an instant knew what the issue was. Do we? Do we? We need to investigate carefully. And especially as we look at different things in our lives, uh, we need to ask ourselves, you know, uh, do I have an anger problem? <laughs> Some people just say, oh, well, that's just the way I am. I've always been an angry person. Uh, do I have a, a lust problem? Uh, do I have a greed problem? Uh, do I have a gossip problem? Am I always looking for the richest story that's being circulated and and am I anxious then to spread that on to somebody else? Do I have problems in my life that I'm not recognizing? We may need some help here, not only in examining ourselves against the Word of God, but maybe we need to ask people around us who know us. What would they say? Have you said, um, hey, do you see anything in me that's a weakness that maybe I need to give attention to? Let them have their say. And let them honestly be able to speak to us about those types of things. But we need to detect the weaknesses in our lives. I promise you one thing. Satan knows the weaknesses of our lives. He knows exactly where to hit us because he knows the weaknesses of our lives. And then the last thing I would leave with you then is that we need to be proactive about temptation then. If we've identified some things that are weaknesses, places where we're vulnerable, places where we're not following what God's Word has to say about us, then we need to go to work and come to reject it. Come to reject it. Come to reject it. Several years ago, Tony Evans wrote a book that I've used with some men's discipleship groups that I've worked with in the past. Good title, No More Excuses. No More Excuses. Chapter by chapter, he would take one men's issue after the next men's issue after the next men's issue. Because his basic thesis was, is that whenever something is pointed out to us, or whenever we think of something that might be a weakness in our lives, our tendency is to say, ah, it's not that big a deal. Or it's not that important. Or it's just the way I am. And what Tony calls us to do, and called men to do in that book, chapter by chapter, every single thing, he says, stop making excuses. And deal with the things that God wants us to deal with. No more excuses. No more excuses. 
Leave it with one last verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And um, let me say, first of all, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and I fully realize 1 Corinthians 10, 13 can be used in two ways as far as understanding what it's talking about. Uh, it can be used in terms of uh, trials that we're going through. It's going to use the word temptation, but it can refer to hardships that God's allowed into our lives. But at the same time, it can also be dealing with what I'm talking about this morning, temptations, vulnerabilities, weaknesses that need to be addressed. just want to capture a couple of things here. No temptation has overtaken you, but such is as common to man. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. Now, obviously, that's a great encouragement, right? When trials come into our lives, God says, I will not allow any more than uh, I will allow. I'll have my hand on the throttle the whole time. But when it comes to the issue of temptations, the thing that I just want us to note that he says here is that if we'll take the time to discover the vulnerabilities, the weaknesses, the things in our lives that we ought to be paying attention to when we're seeking to detect what God is not pleased to see there, well, notice this. There's a way of escape. He promises a way of escape for anyone who will dare to turn to him and say, God, I need to be delivered from this. Help me out of this. Guide me out of this. I would just close this morning by just simply saying that whenever you talk about a topic like this, you feel like you need really to just say, today is the day that we need to change. Today is the day that we need to say, Yes, I'm a person who has temptations. Yes, I have not conquered them all. Yes, I'm not even aware of them all. Yes, I need to spend more attention discovering them all. And yes, I will begin calling to God to ask me to help me so that I can be delivered from them all. Today is the day maybe for someone here to do that maybe for all of us to do that. Let's bow together. Father, I thank you today for the perfect example of Jesus in an issue that we have in our lives, whether we realize it to the degree that it's there or not. And so I pray today that following the example of Jesus, we would be serious about this issue of yielding to the temptations which we have allowed to take root and to express themselves in our thinking, in our attitudes, in our behavior, our speech, whatever way. But help us today to follow his example and find the way out and the way to control and the way to overcome so that we will be then more like Jesus. And for that, we will pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Strive.
Let's pray. Father, thank you today for the time of worship and fellowship and singing and just enjoying this time away from the world. I pray now that as we leave the place that um, we'll take with us our experience, take with us the instruction, take with us, Lord, the presence of Christ in a fresh new way as we face what this world brings at us in this coming week. Help us to be victorious in every challenge that comes at us. Help us to overcome the temptation to treat things other than the way you would be pleased to see. And so dismiss us now with grace and peace and with that resource that we'll need every one of those times because we pray it in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. amen.